Welcome back to another episode of Nerding Out with Victor. Today, I'm joined by Christian Walter from Nine Elements and many other things. And today, we'll be diving deep into the world of firmware and hardware. So welcome to the show, Christian. Hey, thanks. Hi, Victor. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So maybe for the audience, do you want to do a quick introduction to yourself so people understand a bit more your background and just uh, paint a little bit of, uh, of, of the conversation I guess we'll be having in the next 45 minutes, an hour? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, my name is Chris, obviously. Um, and um, I'm, you know, I've been around firmware for a couple of years now, six years, seven years now. Um, so I, my, my background is a little bit on IT security, right? I studied IT security uh, a decade ago, <laughs> I don't know. And, um, yeah, I worked, uh, but I was always amazed by hardware. So I did like a lot of hardware security in terms of, um, you know, side channel attacks and this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, then kind of emerged into the firmware space. And, um, since yeah, five, five, six years, I'm at nine elements now, um, leading, the, the department that does firmware development, um, and also, um, do a bunch of other things there, right? So I founded another company now that does firmware testing, um, as a product. Um, we, a couple of years ago, we founded the open source firmware foundation, um, which is a nonprofit, uh, organization in the U S. Um, and you know, all these kind of things. So basically my, my day, my week, Monday to Sunday, right? That's all about firmware. Um, and everything in between. And um, the focus is really on, you know, open source, um, pushing open source uh, firmware forward. That's that's kind of the... Amazing. Yeah, so I was introduced to you by David Hendricks from uh, Coreboot. And um, mm-hmm. the reason why initially I wanted to have you on the show uh, before knowing more about your background, which made me even more uh, interested in having you on the show, was around bias security. Because I, I asked David... Uh, who I should speak to to kind of chat about the whole new wave of bias vulnerabilities that we've seen in the last what, 18 mm-hmm. months or so by now. Mm-hmm. And your name came up as a, a, a good person that can both speak about it from a technical perspective, but is also good at understanding the big picture of the whole ecosystem. So maybe that's a good starting point. Uh, so we've seen in the last 12 months, we've seen Logo fail, we've seen Pixie fail. Let's just start there. Let's let's talk a bit about them. How did they? Uh, what happened? What are they? Uh, let's start with logo felt, perhaps. Just describe what that is and 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 why it's so, I guess, so critical. Uh, and yeah, like why it really should be drawn more attention to. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that's a lot of pressure now that you're bringing <laughs> in here from from David, right? Um, yes. So logo fail. Um, is, is a vulnerability that that got you know recently published um, I think from binary um, really on um, a couple of uh, firmware vendors allow you to you know customize your your bios right so the firmware that is being utilized um, and um, how they how you can do that is that uh, if you boot up machines you probably want your own you know uh, boot logo showed in the boot process right so it's nice for I don't know corporate companies that say right your um, you're a big company, um, and you want all your corporate machines having the same logos, right? So you want to customize that, right? Or it's nice for people like us, like us, right? Uh, you, you want your your hacker logo, um, you know, uh, <laughs> shown, you know, while, while you're booting up your Lenovo instead of the red Lenovo sign. And um, so, and uh, these these companies actually um, give you give you a way on how you could customize that by um, uploading basically um, images into the firmware, right? Saying um, we have a couple of restrictions, right? It needs to be that in that format. And um, that, that that's the only restriction. Um, <laughs> and um, resolution probably so, too. Resolution probably too, exactly. And um, however, there is a vulnerability in the uh, parser of of the images right so um how that works is you kind of write that into a specific um partition in your in your firmware um, um uh, in your flash drive right where the firmware is stored and it takes it picks it up from there and tries to display it right and while parsing it um it doesn't check you know the boundaries um, of the image right it only cares about is it a you know png right but or is the file end png 
Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if not, you know, off you go. And this kind of um, um, leads to that you can basically um, execute any any code there, right? Because you can trick, um, you can work around the parser, right? And you can, you know, basically um, execute code out of um, out of that memory space that is kind of dedicated for that. For that so you didn't even need to like fake the MIME type. It's just so naive. It just looks file extensions or like that's how rudimentary these checks were. Yes, exactly, exactly, oh, wow. and this is and this is like a huge problem, right? And yeah. um, I, I think that has been there for many, many, many years. And um, this, um, yeah, was recently discovered by Binary, um, which is you know part of the or who are part of the the um, uh, yeah current development that so many vulnerabilities actually get get exposed, right? Because they are doing a pretty good job in in, in actually doing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that's, and, and the blast radius for this vulnerability is pretty massive, right? Because it's basically game over once you can get to that level of, of, of intrusion in the device, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, if you think about it from a security perspective, right, um, you have a couple of, uh, let's say, measurements in, in firmware that you can then actually can do to counter, you know, any attacks that are happening in firmware. Um, there's like the whole secure boot process, right? Mm. There's this, you know, into boot guard and, and all these kind of technologies that you have. Um, however, um, you circumvent all of them basically because um, you are not implanting anything in firmware, right? so you're not overriding anything, um, but rather you're just executing it um, in memory, right? And then, and and that means it's really not preventable in that sense, um, and, mm. and you don't catch it with any other um, with any of the of the technologies that are actually there. So, and this is really like has a massive impact on, on your, um, on the security of your systems. Right. And as you said, um, I think all big IBVs basically were affected by that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, th and that, that shows you, um, that some probably share the same code base. Right. Um, so, and, and, and that's like a huge issue, right. And, and this, this, this image parting, um, algorithm, let's say that get used on you know all platforms basically right it's one of the core things basically that is um at, which is part of the value add that you get um by by going through these through these ibvs and and that is really that has a massive impact and that, and that was something that uh came up in the, the episode i had with with uh core boot um so with mm -hmm. uh, david and matt and, and and one thing i didn't really quite know about the bias structures is, is is how much of this code base that is reused cross vendors. So it's not just like AMI would have their set of binaries that they share across yeah. their biases, but it's 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 almost like open source components that are like dealt between vendors as well. So the blast okay. radius span so many vendors. And to make yeah. matters worse, I guess, at least from an audit perspective, is there's no easy way to tell if you were affected by it. And and because there's no S bomb or something that you can say, oh, this component is used in my bias. It's just like yeah. you're affected. Maybe maybe if you have a good bias vendor, they will tell you. But more often than not, if you bought your device through an ODM or some supplier, you would most likely not even know that you're available, right? Which is yeah. bias security exactly. is fascinating that way. Yeah, exactly. Right. And this is, I think, um, David explained, explained that pretty good in the, in the other episode, right? This is how, because of the whole supply chain on what you yeah. have, your vibe, right? So, um, and actually there's an interesting paper from the UFI, um, org, right? Um, that, that talks about this as well. Um, but, um, what they're trying to do is trying to make a case to, to, um, so if you fight a CVE, right, there's normally something like a 90 day period, right, where mm. um, after 90 days, you, uh, it gets disclosed, right, and, and yeah. um, you have to fix it. Um, for UFI um, security vulnerabilities, um, it's 300 days, right? So that's like wow. <laughs> three and a half, right, or something like that. Yeah. And um, that paper kind of talks about this, right, why this is exactly the case. And um, this is because there are so many parties involved. In, in that ecosystem, that supply chain is so complex, basically, mm. um, that tracking down who owns the code, right? And then, you know, it has to be fixed somewhere and then it has to kind of flow back through all the stations again um, until you can actually release it. 
Um, yeah. it's, it takes so long that 300 days, 300 days um, should be like the, the period um, until we disclose or, or they disclose these kind of things, right? And that means um, a security issue that gets discovered now, right? Yeah. They fix it next year, right? In March. That's so crazy. this is kind of, <laughs> and this is um, and this is pretty amazing, right? And um, I think David David really ex explained that a lot, right? You got like the silicon vendors, right? They're doing code, right? You got like the the IBVs, they do value art. You got the OEMs, the ODMs, right? And then it goes to mm. the fab, and then you burn it on the flash at the end. And this is um, like that whole chain is extremely complex. Everything is proprietary in that, right? Um, sharing code is really sometimes on a you know zip file basis and this kind of stuff. So that supply chain is brutal, right? And if you find an issue there, it has a huge impact because fixing that issue takes so much time, right? And so much effort um, that that's you know sometimes it's not worth it in that sense right because they say okay it's it's an ADO machine you know, whatever and um, yeah and, and also like one thing that was fascinating to me is 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 the amount of regressions you're dealing with as well because you might fix something but then because things are not version like we're not talking a git repo here like most the most sophisticated vendors they might have a git repo for their source code but so much of this is just dealt with files on some file share so you pick that and you patch it but then you forgot the other patch and then you have a regression instead right yes yes yeah i mean we're all humans right and and, sure. and naturally we make these mistakes right and yeah, yeah um but we have some tooling that could help us right to prevent these kind of things and then I that's dive really... in, yeah i want to dive into that in a second i want to kick that kind of liver down the episode but yeah, yeah absolutely that's that's another thing that i wanted to cover here so mm -hmm. the other thing is Pixie fail, which is another one that happened. I think it was disclosed what three months after logo fail or something along yep. those lines. I would imagine, yep. right? Yep. Uh, right? Talk a bit more about what that is and how that attack vector looked like. Yeah, so Pixie fail. I think it's a bunch of vulnerabilities, right? Um, I think they released nine um, in total, or eight, eight or nine in total. So it was a chained um, that, attack. Um, um, no, it's different, different vulnerabilities that have like different oh. impacts, basically. Right? Okay. Um, but they kind of all, I guess, explore the same, the same concept, let's say. Um, and probably, probably you know how to, how to pixie boot a device, mm -hmm. right? So that's sure. kind of uh, the DHCP server. Um, so, so it's basically network booting, right? That's yeah. like the, yeah, yeah. the, the core thing on pixie booting. And what happens under the hood is, um, the DHCP server, when they send out their responses, basically, there there are fields in that response um, that um, tell your device where the Pixie uh, server is, right? So where can I load my images from and this kind of things. And um, there, again, was um, um, you could craft a DC, DC, uh, DHCP message that um, when the when your firmware parses this message, right? Um, you can kind of escape the parser and um, do code execution again, right? Because um, they also, again, we didn't check for, or they, they didn't check for bound boundaries correctly, right? And you're kind of escape escaping that and can basically execute everything, right? And mm. the crucial thing here is you don't have to have access to the device, rather just right. to the network, right? Um, this is kind of, um, which makes makes it, for me at least, a little bit more critical in that yeah. sense, because... For, uh, for, for logo fail, you have to have access to the device, right? And probably, um, you know, ele elevated access in terms of you need to be able to run the tooling, um, that, that you can, um, you know, update the, the boot logo. Um, for, 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 for Pixie fail, you don't have to do that, right? You have to be, you know, part of the network and you have to uh, be able to send these messages out and so on and so forth. And, um, but this gives you just like a whole other, um, uh, if, yeah, privileges that you need basically and access that you need to the device, right? And it's basically remote code execution, um, yeah. which is, which is pretty brutal, right? Yeah. And yeah, again, it's, it's, um, I think the, the vulnerability was found in the upstream EDK2 repo repository and, and EDK2 is, um, an open source implementation of, of the UFI spec. And, um, that also gets consumed by, um, by the SOC vendors. Right. And then again, drips down the supply chain basically. Um, and, um, and, and lands in, in your device. Right. And that, that's again, one of these attacks that has like huge 
blast of, you know, really everyone is affected on that. And we need to check, uh, fix the, the supply chain, you know, walking up the whole thing, chain, fix up the upstream repos, and then it kind of drips down um, into each and every device. And, and was this an attack vector purely exploitable by the fact that I guess most modern and uh, modern motherboards have built in NICs on the motherboard. If you had, say, an external network interface, would you still be vulnerable? Or is that kind of like the attack vector is that you get in and because it's kind of in the bias space, so to speak, uh, why it's vulnerable? Or is that unrelated entirely? Um, I think it's not related to if you have a NIC on board or if you have a separate, I don't know, PCI card that has a NIC on it, right? Because once you, I mean, UFI is, is a whole operating system, basically, mm. right? You have all the drivers available. Um, you can, um, yeah, you have all, all NICs available most of the time. Um, mm. You have all the USB ports available. So basically you could also, if you have these USB dongles that, that, that you can plug in the network cable, um, you can basically boot from that as well, right? So right. it's, it's really not bound to one of, one of the NICs. Um, you can. In firmware, of course, you can dictate everything, right? And said, okay, mm -hmm. we only do pixie boot from that, from that specific NIC, right? This is for sure possible. Um, however, the attack itself um, is not not limited to that. Right. So it, it's just a channel into the BIOS, essentially. It boots into a special boot shell, essentially, that you then have direct access to the BIOS, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the most interesting question to me when we look at both logo fail and pixie fail is why now right we've been having biases for for ages right but then over the span of eight week eight months or six months whatever it was between them we had two that are like holy shit vulnerabilities in the bio space after i think logo fail was the first real severe bias vulnerability that i ever heard of and now we have two in the span of like six to eight months. So why now? What changed? Is it just more eyes on it? Is there something that changed in general? Or uh, yeah, what do you make out of that? Um, I think it's more eyes on it, right? Mm -hmm. So really, um, I do see um, that. So for, for a very long time, firmware, you know, had one job, right? Boot up the device. That's mm. it, right? And yeah. no one cared about it, right? You have it there, right? Everyone cared about once you hand it off to the bootloader or to your operating system, you know, you care about that stack basically that is running mm -hmm. there. Everyone tried to make that as secure as possible, right? as open as possible. Um, but firmware was just there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, you know, it had the job of booting the device that, that was right. Like. And um, I think the, um, the US government, you know, um, made, uh, uh, was there was like a pre presidential act um, that, that stated, okay, firmware is critical software, right? And right. we should um, look at it, right? And there's this NIST, um, I think it's called the NIST 800 um, paper, right? Or guidelines, which kind of said, okay, um, we need to take care of what more uh, security in firmware, right? There's, there should be certain things that sh firmware needs to de deliver, right? Or there are certain promises that, that firmware needs to stand up, right? right? So you need to be able to, you know, downgrade, upgrade, um, and, and all these kind of things, transfer of ownership and so on and so forth. And um, that whole topic just gets more attention, right? So there are a couple mm -hmm. of companies, um, yeah, Binary, for example, um, did like a huge, uh, you know, financial round, right? And, and did some, um, you know, marketing around their finding exploits and this kind of stuff. So there's really more going on in that space, I mm. think, right? So firmware, but firmware attacks themselves, right? They're here for, for years already, right? Yeah, I I saw I think I saw um, a talk about ten twelve years ago, you know where they were attacking AMD CQB, these kind of things, right? So yeah, it's there for a very long time. I just think that people care more about it now, right? Because um, it slowly drips down into the brains of the people that security starts in firmware, right? It has yeah. to because everything is rooted there. And if you don't take care of that part um, and do it in the right way, basically, then this is, um, it, it will get you, right? And, and there's no way to circumvent that. Um, there's no way against this. Thing. So um, I think, think that's, for me, at least one of the, of the main reasons. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason why at least I got excited about 
things like core boot and and various tool open source bias and all these things uh mm. like last year when you started to look into to exactly this right like what user space security is completely moot if you can't protect the first boot process right and and biases is just, and all all things firmware really right and that so i think it's 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 very it's very good that we've seen a lot more attention drawn towards this um in particular around tpms as well right because that's tightly coupled with the bias uh at least with discrete tpms right so maybe that's a good segue into tpms because i i saw a post you posted on linkedin the other day which i think was really interesting about intel tpm attacks but maybe let's start with a tpm like what's the primer like talk about the different types of tpms and then we can dive slightly deeper into um this this news that i, I you shared with uh, with these attack vectors yeah so tpm itself is um, a trusted platform module so and um what it is it's it's a specifically hardened chip let's say um which should anchor your security right so the idea is that okay um you know, all you have on your, you know, normal CPU and whatsoever, right? That's like general purpose stuff. And you need to have something that is specially made for security, right? Which is temper proof, uh, at least temper evident and things. Um, when, when it comes to security, you probably need that. Um, so you use that as an anchor for your whole boot process, right? So if you think about, um, booting a platform, it's always that you need some kind of anchor or root of trust, right? Where you, start from right there's always something that you need to trust um there's basically no way around it something is always there that you need to trust and then you build up your chain of of trust basically from there right and go mm. and the tpm um has you know a couple of interfaces to your your cpu let's say and um from a functional functionality point of view you can actually measure things into a tpm right so there are a couple of registers in the tpm and um, how that works is um, you you basically write a hash to the TPM, and what it does under the hood is um, it takes the value of the of the register that is already there, um, concatenate is, uh, concatenate the, the new hash with it, and hash it all together right, again, so mm -hmm. that um, you just do not just copy hashes over, right? But this is this should prevent like um, replay attacks in that sense, and um, um, yeah, so you have these couple of registers, right? You have like an NVRAM where you can store stuff. Um, and TPM has a couple of functionalities that, that you can use um, to do that. And there's, of course, like a discrete TPM, which is like a dedicated chip, right, um, mm -hmm. that you have there. Um, there are firmware TPMs, um, which are, for example, um, Intel provides that. They have um, in the Intel ME, right? Um, they, they have a software emulated TPM basically um, that, that you can use um, or you can use um, yeah like root of trust modules which are more than just the TPM right they provide like a little bit more functionality around um, to basically secure secure your boot process mm -hmm. um, so this vulnerability that you mentioned uh was in, in in that LinkedIn post? Uh, maybe talk a bit about that. Was but by Intel TPMs being essentially, you could unseal the Intel TPM by reassigning some pins uh, from user space. So maybe that yeah. I think that was fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, the concept of sealing and unsealing secrets in TPMs is basically so we have a bunch of registers that I, what I explained before, right? Where you can measure things into, right? So you you write hash values into that, get concatenated get updated and um, the process of sealing and unsealing is that you can put a secret key into the tpm and seal it against the the current um, values of the pcrs these, these are how these registers are called right and um, they're called platform configuration registers and so that means it's you have to imagine that like a lock right and you have like all the numbers right basically on the so you have like six one one six oh right and that's and you seal your 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 secret key again and to unseal that key again from the tpm um that um would, would only work if you have the same pcr values again and you can unseal it right and this is essentially how bitlocker works uh, from mm -hmm. windows right so if you boot into windows um there's bitlocker which has like hard uh, which encrypts your whole hard drive and um 
they measure firmware measures the boot process, right? So you always take the chunk of the code, put that into the TPM, right? And they sealed a key prior in that TPM. You know, and if all the registers are right, right? So that means your firmware is in the state that you want it to be, they unseal it, right? And then you know, boot. And um and this the TPM itself is connected to pins to your, you know to your SOC, right? So the SOC has to have a way, you know, there's like LPC or, or eSpy um, to actually talk to that TPM, right? And send these measurements over. And um, in, on, on Intel SOCs, um, you have a couple of GPIOs, right? And they have, they are multifunction GPIOs, right? So these GPIOs have um, multiple functionalities, right? So they can either be an eSpy, um, you know, reset line, or they can be, you know, anything something else right so and you you can basically define that in on, on what you want that to be and um what that guy found out um in the article that i posted there was that um mo majority of the firmwares or he, he couldn't find any that are actually locking down that gpio configuration right so this is written in firmware but it needs to be locked down saying okay this cannot be changed anymore mm. and that this is not done um, on, on more or less any, any of the devices, right? So that means you can, um, reset the TPM at, in any, at any state, right? And, um, you can basically try to replay the, um, you know, writing the, the hashes again into the TPM, um, try to replay what the firmware actually does, right? And then kind of unseal what secrets are in the TPM. Mm. And, um, you can do that from the operating system, right? So, because, um, yeah, Intel gives you guidelines on how to, you know, lock this configuration down. But if you haven't done that, um, you can do that from the operating system. And so whatever is in your TPM, that's not safe anymore, right? So, and imagine um, you have access to one of, one of, one of a device where a TPM is basically attached to. Um, if you can boot into any other, you know, live operating system whatsoever, right? You just reset the TPM and replay the whole thing. Um, and and get the key out of it, right? And then you can boot into your other operating system, which is basically encrypted, maybe, um, or for whatever you use the key for. Um, yeah. And then and then you have it, right? Because normally you store something like you know a symmetric key. Yeah. Yeah. So that that means that, I mean, we, we at Screenly we use um, the TPMs for for our MTLS, right? So that's where we store the uh, the private key for for all MTLS, right? So that means that. Uh, in if you're vulnerable to this kind of attack vector, you could extract that private key and you could mimic MTLS. Well, not mimic even. You would actually do proper MTLS traffic based on that private key and and mimic the device. Yep. But I guess it also means that it it completely spans uh, uh, encryption technologies. I guess uh, in the sense that it's uh, it spans encryption technologies in the sense that. It doesn't matter if you're using Lux or something on Linux stack. If it's BitLocker, it's all the same under the hood, right? It's just some kind of well, certificate that you have or private key that you have stored yeah. in there, which makes it kind of terrifying from an attack vector, right? Yeah, exactly, right? And this is uh, someone just handed you over the key, right? It doesn't matter, yeah. you know, whatever you have afterwards, right? You have yeah. the secret, right? And this is like yeah. the crucial thing. And, your cipher uh, or how you encrypt it doesn't really matter at that point. Yeah, yeah, right, right. It, it 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 really doesn't matter anymore, right? So if someone handed handed you the keys, you know, to my house, right, the lock doesn't matter anymore. Right? Yeah. Um, you you got the key. So and this is and this is why it's it's for me I think critical. And what I find even more astonishing is you know he explains you know in the article you know on how it works and you know what what he did to actually you know find that out and he you know um he contacted intel right saying i found this right and um i think it's it's a security issue right and intel kind of responded yeah no we have in in the bias writer guide right which you have on the nda um there's a section which says this is how you lock it down and um if you don't do it right, that's not our problem anymore, right? So there's no CVE for that, right? And um, so, and then they agreed on a disclosure date, right? This in, and he said, okay, I think like two months ago or something like that, he said, right. yeah, I will disclose things June first, and everyone was like, yep, fine, right? And then and and then there was no disclosure process basically, 
And this is, I don't know, right? So I would have hoped for more responsibility on, you know, on an Intel side saying, even maybe it's not our problem, right? But we are getting in the people because we see in the wild, no one is doing that, yeah. right? Um, so we are going to our, you know, vendors saying, you know, this is an issue, guys, right? Can we kind of fix that up? It basically comes down to like a sensible default at the end of the day, right? Like why is this a default configuration when it will have a massive security uh, implications for <laughs> for the vast majority of the ODMs and OEMs that do not reconfigure these like super low level settings, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess that brings me over to uh, the one of the projects that you've been working on, the, the firmware CI project. So maybe we can... Speak a bit about that and speak a bit about what it is in the first place, how that fits into kind of try to solve for problems like this and similar similar pro- attack vectors in, in general and like bringing modern tooling into the firmware world, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, Nine Elements is an, an, uh, an IFV, right? That's how we call it. I mean, independent. And while we work on a lot of firmware and with a lot of customers, um, we noticed that, you know, not a lot of customers actually have, you know, a proper CI system mm. for their firmware, right? Because firmware um, is, because firmware is the first code that starts on every device, right? So that means it, um, there is no abstraction, abstraction layer between firmware and, and the hardware because firmware is the abstraction layer, right? Everything that you, you know, test on the operating system or run on the operating system, you have an abstraction layer, drivers that abstract the hardware for you and for firmware that's the, that's just not possible so that means um firmware has to be tested on hardware right? mm. there's no way around it right so there is you can test limited things um you know qmu and this kind of things right yeah. and if you have enough, enough money and people you can write your own simulator for your hardware that you're to build but if you are a normal company um that's kind of out of scope so, but even if you, um, but even but even if you do, like you're still as building those assumption assumptions essentially, so it's still not as valid. Of course, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, you get certainty, I think, to a very high degree, right? If you right. if you build your own simulator, um, but yeah, it's not the real deal, right? Because yeah. um, in the end, it has to run hardware. And um, yeah, that, that's why we thought of okay, maybe um, we can come up with you know, a test framework that makes this easier, right? So certainly there are test frameworks already out there. A lot of them are already out there and, you know, some, some are already used for, for film, testing firmware, right? So there's um, the OpenBMC test automation tool, right? Um, and, and other things that, that you can actually test firmware with. However, our, well, my view on this was always, okay, it has to be easy for the end user, right? So the end user is the, the, the guy or the girl that we're actually working with, and he or she needs to be able to easily um, set up the whole thing, right, and write tests and things. So we built a framework that makes this much, much easier. Um, and we, it's a server client model, right, and the server mm-hmm. orchestrates everything, and um, the client... The client is there to interface with the hardware, right? So to, right. if you have a new image, you write to it, and you, you get like the serial logs or you get display output or whatever you have um, from, from the, the device under test. From, um, and you, you perform your tests, right? And um, with that, we saw that this is useful for us, uh, nine mm. elements um, in the first place, because this really helps us um, scale better. Um, and we also see that for customers that that they that they that there was a need actually um, mm. that that they wanted to have that right because reality was the customers that we talk to a lot of them do manual testing right we are talking to one company that every they are not even doing firmware development but they want to validate the firmware that is running on their devices right so that means when they get a new firmware drop from their you know OEM Dell Lenovo whatever. Um, they want to put that on the machines and then they have like tests that they want to run on that, um, seeing, you know, does, does, this, does everything still make sense, right? Is it configured right. the way that we want it to be, right? Is, um, can I um, switch the variables that um, if, if I turn on secure boot, right? Can I still turn on and things on and off, right? Or or is 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 that prohibited the way it should be, maybe, right? So and, basically writing um, like unit tests against hardware, essentially. 
Yeah, right, right. You could you could say that. Yeah, and um, that helped them. For example, you know, that was like a process for each firmware drop for each hardware. Five days, one guy kind of um, uh, sitting there and 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 trying to you know do all the tests. You know, have some extra seats and this kind of stuff. Um, mm. and, and writing it all down, and they you know automated the whole thing to down to thirty six hours, forty hours, because the tests still need to run, right? This still mm. takes time, um, sure. but no one needs to sit there. And right. that, that was like the overall goal um, that, that we are aiming for, and um, yeah, it's it's starting out pretty good, right? Because we see like a lot of you know feedback that this is something that people want um, and that they help them. Um, everything is like very user friendly. So yeah. I, think, I think that's, that's, and what we're trying to do is here really, you know, the tools that, that have been used for, you know, many, many years already on, on the higher level stacks, right? Websites development, right? And, and, and back and front end, you know, if you have, um, if you write an iOS application, right? I, I think you have like a whole simulator and, and you run yeah. tests all over again and this kind of stuff for firmware that's just not there. Right? And um, so we try to, to basically break that. Um, and say, okay, there's an easy way to do that. We still need hardware for sure, um, but you can easily get it. Yeah, I think that's that has been a recurring theme in a lot of the episodes that we've done around hardware is around the fact that hardware, firmware build, development, testing, and distribution is really just so far behind modern software development. Like it's like, it's kind of the works on my machine kind of set up for, for yep. a lot of these, uh, like some guy built the firmware on his machine, sends it to some file share, uh, and then, well, that's a release. Um, and that's yep. just obviously miles away from how, or away from how yep. modern software development is, is done in general. Totally. And I mean, and this is not Joe, right? Zip fights is still like one of the standards, right? right? And this is... Yeah. Um, I don't know. You are getting. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm panicking, right? Sometimes if I see that, saying, okay, right. this is this is like where the world runs on, right? And with right. all the um, cloud stuff that is happening nowadays, right? With all the push to AI now, where this all the whole infrastructure gets just gets more and more and bigger, and bigger right? And there's still, you know, two people sitting there. I don't say that 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 they're not smart people, right? They're probably good right. firmware developers, right? But still sure. two people sitting there, right? Four I principle sending zip files around, right? With the dash underline, you know, finder or whatever, right? So, and this is, yeah. and and we have to think about that, right? If we maybe want to lift that into 2024, um, yeah. and say, let's let's do modern, modern software development. Yeah. And I think, I, I remember first exposure that I had to, to working with firmware or even like embedded code base was like, modern coding principles like linting your code base and these things are like they are like completely foreign concept and like unit testing they were like completely foreign concept for for the traditional firmware developer right and that's kind of like it's terrifying when you do see the real implication of that with things like poke pixie fail logo fail all these problems right yeah totally i mean to be fair right um for example, unit tests are hard also in future sure. sometimes, right? It really, um, because for unit tests, you need to also be able to abstract uh, interfaces, right? To, yeah. to any other um, uh, yeah, hardware that you have. basically, And um, this is not easily possible in firmware always, right? It's not always easily possible, right? So UFI, in UFI, it's better possible because they have these protocols, right? And it's handled and you can easily um, you know, hand that in. Um, for core boot, for example, um, parts that's also harder, right? Because mm -hmm. um, we we have a different concept on, on how we access the hardware. Um, there are efforts, and we have unit testing for parts of the code, um, but some parts are just not covered. Unit testing yeah. because it's it's um, yeah, it's it effectively just not possible, right? So, and then the mm -hmm. only way is testing on real hardware, right? And then I think you need something that you can easily get going, right? Instead of you know everyone writing their own Python or bash scripts again. And you try to kind of punch that into, you know, your own GitLab runner and see how you can. Then someone else does something else again. And yeah. um, if we can unify on that a little bit, I think, I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've had the same exact problem at Screenly, right? It's like we, we build a device that's an end-to-end -end device that does something on a screen, but like doing that in automated end-to-end -end fashion is, is very difficult because like you basically end up having to like, 
do some kind of HDMI capturing device, do a search on the image. Like it gets very complicated very quickly to do that well at scale, right? Because you want to test it across like 10 different types of devices. Well, that gets very, very difficult very quickly, right? Yeah. Yeah, I totally understand that, right? And um, and, and if you it's, it, it's exactly the same problems, right? Um, mm. And for example, to give you to give you an, uh, to give you an example, right? When we do this firmware validation, um, basically, so what we're doing is um, we, for example, testing secure boot, right? And we are mm. also enrolling um, broken certificates, right? So we're trying oh, right. to see if the machine recognizes that, right? And mm. from time to time, we are breaking the machines along the way. Right. And um, then you have, um, depending on the vendor that you're working with, there's like a more or less complicated process, which involves, you know, uh, copying over text from the screen, right? And punching it into the third party tool, right? And then getting the secret again and punching that in, into the device again and so on and so forth. So you need to, you know, screen capture, right? You need to be able yeah. with you, to read the text that is actually displayed on the screen, right? So you have Serial to make console sense of capturing all this probably as well. Yeah. No, and then this is, um, and it's insane how complex this kind of stuff is actually. Yeah. Um, and I, I, of course, understand that this is a hard thing to do, right? I always think that working with hardware is indeed hard, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and I think everyone that, that works in, in the hardware field kind of agrees with that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I would wish for a much higher level stack. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. And we yeah. just have to make it more easy. Right for people yeah. to use that because I think it all comes down to, um, yeah, usability and you know how low can you actually put the barrier for people to you know get into that. Absolutely, this is part of the problem why why really the the whole security is in su such a crucial state. Let's say anything, right? Because the barrier is so high and mm -hmm. um, you know um, everyone, everyone is looking on the budget, right? There's always, of course, no budget for testing. And um, especially this extensive testing that you have to do on hardware, um, everything you know is cost if you know, cost intensive to set up and so on and so forth. So and that's like a huge pain, right? And um, mm. and we have to really look into that um, and see see how we can solve that. Absolutely. So so looking back a little bit, what we spoke about a few minutes ago about um, the the push towards security in software, and it seems like a lot of these pushes. They've come from the executive order. It seems like that was like the first like force for hardware vendors to actually, I guess, take security serious, right? And and it seems to kind of go hand in hand with the whole S bomb requirements as well. And I think that has kind of shook in the hardware industry significantly. And I've had quite a few conversations with BIOS vendors and and firmware vendors that are really like they are. It was a rude awakening for them to like really get into like, oh, we actually need to start doing this now. They, it's like secure has been brushed on the rug for decades. And now it's like, they, they, oh, these are smart people. They knew they had a problem, right? They just was never prioritized. But now yeah. with these new mandates from the US government, and, and you see the same thing in other like follow on mm. legislation in other countries, but that's, mm. it seems with ours, the tipping point that was needed for people to start paying attention. I feel I'm usually not one for over regulation, but security feels like one of these spaces where it was needed to change the status quo to get to where we actually need to go. Right. It's yep. um, almost like where the invisible hand will fail otherwise, because there is no market. Well, there's no demand otherwise. Otherwise it's to race to the bottom. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, but sometimes I think these things have to come, you know, basically top to bottom, right? Let's yeah. say it like that. Because um, security is always like, why do people do security, right? I mean, wh why do you care about security? Yeah. Right? And um, you don't, right? <laughs> the majority <laughs> of the people don't care about it, right? So it either has to be, you have to be, um, you know, compliant with something, mm. right? The, 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 you know, a very little part of you know of the developers or you know companies or whatever do security out of their own strong belief that it has to be like that right the, mm -hmm. the most of the people is okay we need to be compliant with that right because someone else is dictating that on us right and if yeah. we don't if we're not compliant we're not able to sell it right, right. And, the, and and that's that's the, the main driver 
along you know, with all of these kind of things. And yes, it's you know it's terrifying to see these exploits, right? And it's um, it's it's terrifying to see these, what in what state fear of security is. But if there's no mandate, right? If no one is mandating it um, from the top, saying okay, if you want to sell something here, right, th there has yeah. to be you know a bottom line that you have to fulfill, right? Otherwise, you know, take your stuff and you know go somewhere else. Um, that it will not change, right? And that, yeah. that's and that's that's a fact because everything is running on business model. And um, we see that in the U.S. a lot, right? The Europe, um, European Union also, you know, there's like the, you know, sovereignty cloud kind of things, right? So we have to own our and so on and so forth, right? And they also slowly get to the point that probably starts in firmware. So um, I, I, I'm also not really a fan of, you know, as you said, over-regulating everything and so on and so forth. But I think sometimes it's necessary to push you know, the companies um, that are responsible yeah. for that basically into into the right direction. Yeah, and I think there is a similar one on the EU side with the, the EU cybersecurity law because a lot of these things, they come from the IoT world, right? They are like, mm -hmm. oh, your baby camera cannot have a default password. And that's mm -hmm. like, yeah, we all know this. <laughs> uh, like anybody who has any sense of like understanding of security understands that, yes, of course you don't do this, but unless there is a legal push for this, the cheapest vendor in China will kind of gain market share, right? So we, there needs to be some kind of a yeah re, a force in the market to, yeah. to make that happen. Yeah, but this all also only makes sense to us, right? So mm. for us, like, yeah, of course you don't, you know, there should be a default, password, right. right? Or you probably change that or whatever, right? But to right. like 90% of the other people, right, that are just using, you know, the baby camera, all right, it's easy, right? Yeah. The password is like one, two, three, five, right? That's good. I yeah. can remember that, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I can and access I it to... remotely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Oh, that's great, right? I can yeah. see my kid basically when I'm at work, right? Yes, right. it's good, but everyone else as well, right? And maybe yeah. it has an implication on they know when you are home, right? Yeah. They probably break into your home and this kind of stuff. And um, I think this, I mean, it's it's footwork basically, right? So we you have to explain that to the people. Um, why you are actually doing that? Because I think sometimes this feels like you are making things more com complicated than, than yeah. they have to be, right? I mean, um, you know, my mother would say, you know, it worked that way before, right? So why yeah. why do I have to now have like twenty characters, right, and and, and digits and this kind of stuff, right? It's like, yeah, yeah until their bank account get compromised, and, and <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> there are exactly. real consequences at stake, right? And I I, I think that's. And I think that the California law, uh, the, I'm blank on the name for the Californian IoT provisions that started this whole wave. And now, mm. I mean, I, I, I see that as a positive thing. But um, bef like, I, I don't want to take too much time with that because there are some other things I want to cover with you as well because you have, you have a lot of interesting things you've been working on. So I mentioned you mentioned Open Source Firmware Foundation already. You are the founders for that. Let's talk a bit about that. Like, what, what's the goal? What are you guys doing? Uh, I think that's that's a foundation that should get a good shout out. Yeah, thanks. First of all, um, yeah. So yeah, um, as I said, right. So we're working a lot in the in the open source firmware ecosystem, right. So that means um, we are really really active in all the communities, um, and we are really trying to you know advance the state of, of open source firmware. And um, what we but what we see is that. You know, firmware gets like very little love, right? From and very little attention mm. from from a lot of people. And so with that, okay, we need then there need to be one, you know, point of contact, you know, one umbrella kind of thing where we can place everything under in that sense, where people can go, where people can educate themselves on, you know, mm. what is firmware, you know, why open source and so on and so forth, and where they can reach out to the individual pro project. So, right. And um, one thing that I that I deeply believe in is um, if we want to drive adoption in in firmware in open source firmware, right? So if you want to have open source firmware running on each and every device, um, that needs specification, right? And that needs like um, yeah, we need to specify interfaces, right? How do we talk to you know other software? How do we talk to hardware? And these kind of things, because this is not existent right now, right? Mm. So we have UFI as one one big big body, let's say, and that's just a spec, right? It's put it's per se not proprietary. Um, however, majority of the implementations are right. There's one one implementation 
which is EDK2, which is not, and which is, you know, which is not great, let's say, right? So it's, it's okay, right? And um, so I think, uh, and the UFI spec is rather complicated for a lot of use cases, and I think we can simplify a lot of things. And um, yeah, with, with all these kind of things, uh, we said, okay, we have to have a foundation that kind of incorporates all of them, right? all the players that are in the, in, in the ecosystem, right? So the OEM, ODMs, right? The SOC vendors, the open source firmware projects, the IBVs, and of course the the the, uh, the communities um everyone needs to get on board basically and we have to bring everyone together so that we you know work towards one common goal right and um we're trying to push that basically um so we have like working groups um that um that you know care about for example firmware security right where um where the the founder of binary is also involved um, we have um, we have um, a, a work stream or working group that is around silicon initialization, right? So if you initialize silicon, um, there are different interfaces, or every software vendor builds their own interfaces on how you do that, right? It would be great if you have a common so that that makes it easier for adoption and this kind of thing. Um, and we're trying to drive that through through a nonprofit foundation because I think um, this specs shouldn't be owned by a company. Right, because that's right. also the, the 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 standard right now, right? Intel FS, Intel has the FSP, like the firmware support package um, specification, right? So they specify how their you know FSP looks like and what interface it has. Naturally, no other SOC vendors will adopt that spec, right? Because you know AMD will never ever adopt the spec that is coming from Intel and is owned right. by AMD. So we have to find a neutral ground basically where we can you know, play. And work this kind of things out, and um, yeah, the OSFF um, can be one of this, um, one of this, um, yeah, bodies basically. And it's tied to licensing, or how do you think about those things? Right, obviously, licensing is a hot topic right now in the open source world. How do you view that side of of the firmware, uh, or is that something that is yet to be kind of emerging in the open source firmware world? Um, so the foundation itself, right? It, we don't we don't care about licensing and this kind of things, right? So because okay. uh, that's of course nothing that we want to push, right? So mm -hmm. um, what we really so the, our model is basically that the members that are we have different tiers basically in the foundation, right? And depending on the tier, you can um, kind of um, yeah be part of the conversation on you know what what specifications should be drawn should be driven and, and, you know, making decisions on that part, right? So you have influence on, on the spec, let's say. Um, however, licensing in general is an, is an interesting topic in, for open source firmware as well, right? So um, we have to think about what's the business model for the, the companies that develop, you know, open source firmware, right? Or, or yeah. that, that have open source firmware on their devices. And for example, there's, a Polish company, 3, 3MDAP, um, they are um, they are running a business model where they, you know, you pay a fee basically to get the newest core boot um, uh, version, right? So they have they have mm -hmm. downstream fork of that, and um, you have to pay a fee basically to get the newest version for your device, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's one way to go, right? Um, yeah. Now Elements takes another approach, saying, okay, we are just an agency, right, and we provide support and this kind of stuff, but we, we don't care how many devices you have. Um, but for sure, that's that's an interesting topic in, in open source firmware. And that's um, something where we can all do business, right? I mean, naturally, again, right, even if it's open source, we have to think about how can we do business that is good for everyone. Right. Which is fair for everyone. Yeah. And um, licensing is yeah one, one of the one of the Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, and also like, I guess it's uh, worth doing a shout out to the people actually involved in, in the foundation. You got some, some big names in there. Do you want to speak a bit about who are actually part of the members and who are part of that? So like, cause you got some big brands engaged in, in the actual foundation. So I think it's worth doing a shout out to that as well. Yeah, totally. So, um, um, one of our, you know, co-founding members is uh, Siemens, for example, mm. um, which, um, which is pretty cool, right? Mm. Very, very big company. Um, and they, they give us a lot of trust in terms of coming in so early, um, so that, um, 
that, that we can do what we can do basically and try you know backing us up right because basically when, when Siemens joined you know um, yeah there were only plans let's say right but their like execution was kind of still undergoing and um, we're still you know still doing things and, and still moving forward and uh, yeah Siemens actually provides us a lot of trust there and yeah we have a couple of companies that are actually using open source firmware in their products right and that are actually mm. trying to push for open source right one of the biggest there for sure is yeah Google mm. of course um, Supermicro uh, one of one of the big ones right are they are, are Supermicro using uh, Coreboot on their um, servers or is that something in, on the roadmap or do you know I'm curious. Um, uh, they have a proof of concept um, okay. where they um, run core boot on their servers. Interesting. They are eventually doing business with. Nice. Potentially, yeah. They have it on their roadmap, right? I mean, you would be. I think Supermicro is smart enough, at least, to you know look left and right, right, and see. Okay, we have you know our standard proprietary vendor. And um, there are options, right? And we should, you know, look um, what does that, what implications does that have on our business if we go for open source firmware? Is there other markets that we can kind of tackle? Um, yeah. How does that work from a, you know, royalty kind of view, right? What does it mean money wise for us and this kind of thing? So, Supermicro is, I think, looking into that for sure. Um, yeah. And I imagine, um, I imagine they, they are uh, starting to get more and more nervous from another. Uh, one on your roster, which is Oxide, uh, taking them from the left field in terms of that. So yeah, maybe that's a... <laughs> Oxide is, I mean, Oxide is like extremely radical in um, right. how they do it, right? So, um, I mean, if you ever ever hear um, Brian, you know, uh, speak about it, right? Um, you... Brian, if you are listening to this, I would love to have you on the show, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I get, I get my there. Um, yeah, and, and uh, if, you, if you listen to him, right, he's like very very radical on, um, in a good way, right, on his views um, on how things should be handled and, um, and, and, and uh, yeah, why it should be open source and this kind of things. And actually, you know, I, I saw the Rex um, in person, right? So I, I visited them a couple of times in their, um, in the headquarters and they look neat, right? So mm -hmm. um, everything is custom made, um, you know, from the boards, from the, you know, the, the 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 blends basically in front of the the rack like the whole rack the the bars every, i don't know everything's custom made and everything looks it's proper nerd sleek. porn right <laughs> yeah really i mean you see that oh, that's great i i don't need it right i mean i, right. I will never ever <laughs> buy such a rack right i have no use case for that right? but i want one right because yeah it just looks great and um yeah the, they they are um long-term supporters yeah um on that um i met brian um, on, on like three years ago, on the foundation did some mini summit, which was in parallel to the to the OCP, the Open Computing Project um, Global Summit. It was like a half day, you know, in the back of a conference, right? We had like peanut and, and nuts, right? And, and and Brian was giving a talk about oxide, and uh, there's where we met him. And uh, yeah, it's great to see how how they actually evolved, right? Right now. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, a couple of other companies as well, right? As I said, 3M Lab, of course, is there. Um, System76 is there. Um, mm. uh, Nova Custom is there. So, yeah, it's really great to see them board. And, you know, if, if some company is listening to this, right, said, okay, we are doing open source firmware, right? And we want to be a part of the foundation. I want to at least show up on that website. You can always reach out to Victor, and he then reaches out to me, right? And I will. And in Happy to do introductions. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover before we wrap up, because we're kind of running up on time here, uh, is I'm sure this made the news to you as well, and I'm curious about your take, your hot take on this, is Inside's AI bias, because they were being a bit ridiculed <laughs> yeah. in the press. I'm kind of curious about what, what, your, what, what your hot take on that is. I don't know. I know. I, uh, yeah, no, I saw the news, right? Um, I think at Computex they announced it. That they have AI. I don't really understand what it is, right? So, <laughs> um, it's how I read it is that they, I think the customization of the whole thing, um, is now through AI or you can interact with an AI and it customizes the BIOS for, for your needs. I have no clue how that would practically look like. And mm. I totally think that this is not a good idea, right? Um, <laughs> because I don't, I don't, I couldn't think of a single thing why you would need AI in firmware, right? So um, I, 
from, I, I think firmware should do very little, right? It's just like the basic minimum, right? What, exactly what you need. Um, that should be like very strict. Um, there should be no room for, you know, AIs to interpret whatever they want in between, but rather than, you know, I want to do this and exactly this. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm curious to see what they're doing. Um, but my, my gut feeling really says, um, I'm not entirely sure if that's a good idea. To me, it and sounds it feels, like... It feels like, you know, taking the the current, you know, AI hype, right? We need to do something with AI, right? Every every hardware vendor does, does something with AI, right? They have, where they put NVIDIA, right? And building like the new next AI machines. And this now, and every software stack, basically, mm -hmm. which is, you know, on top of uh, firmware does AI. Um, so whether you want it or not, we need to do, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you want it or not, exactly. And um, so we have to do something as well, right? So let's go yeah. AI. It, it it sounds like a terrifying attack vector from a security perspective. Uh, but yeah, let's see what happens with that. Totally, right? I mean, all the models that they're running on, right, is probably proprietary, right? No one actually knows what's happening inside, right? And I think um, you can perfectly... So I, I talked to a colleague of mine a couple of days ago, right? And he said, you know, an, what an interesting attack vector would be, right? If you have an LMM which you kind of train to inject exploits in the code that it writes, right? Because um, yeah. you're asking an AI, right, you know, write me a parser for, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, right? And then you, who is looking at the code, right? So you copy yeah. the code, see if it builds, ah, it does what it does, right? That's great. Yeah. And um, what if you have, you know, LMMs that are actually injecting um, exploits <clears> there, right? And maybe they are learned and trained on code which had exploits in it and this kind of stuff, yeah. right? So. And this kind of, you know, makes up a whole new channel or vector of, you know, possible attacks where you wouldn't even know who injected the code, right, in, in the yeah. first place. Um, and, and um, yeah, that, that really, that, I think that's terrifying um, yeah. to see. I would be surprised if, if the likes of Binary and these guys who have done uh, some great research are not using this for, for similar, like fuzzing attacks and similar, uh, I would imagine at least. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, yeah. When we get into like obfuscation of, of uh, backdoors and whatnot using AI, that's, that's where it gets really dangerous and, and crazy. So um, yeah, totally. this has been Really great, Christian. Is there anything else you want to do a shout out at bef about before we wrap up? I think you have a conference coming up in the fall. So maybe that's... Yes. Uh... Yeah, that's definitely... Um, so if you... The Open Source Firmware Conference, right, is coming up in September 3rd to 5th. Um, it's an annual conference. Surprise around open source firmware um, and, you know, current developments there. It's very developer-centric, right? So I'm um, really... If you want to get your hands on the topic, that's the conference where you should be. Um, if you, you know, want to find people who can do it, right, that's the place uh, where you can find these people. Um, it will be in Germany. Um, so it will be at the, you know, home, at our hometown, right, at where everything, where the foundation was born, where the conference was born, where an element was born. And, um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to check that out, um, we will, you know, have like go through our offices and all this kind of stuff. Um, we would be happy to host you. OSFC.io is the website that you need to check out. Um, and yeah, it would be great if we if we can you know, see a couple of more faces there. Amazing. I'll make sure to link that in the show descriptions. And uh, thank you so much for coming to the show, Christian. And I'll talk to thanks you soon. Thanks yeah, so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.